All righty, we are back, baby. All prophecy fulfilled. Uh, we are on lesson number 10, I believe, of our series, The Gentiles, Christianity's Best Kept Secret. And as promised, uh, we're going to get into Acts chapter 10 and 11, and we're going to see how Cornelius, a Roman Gentile centurion, drops into Peter's place to see what condition his condition was in. Now, as we've talked about, as far as Peter was concerned, uh, Cornelius's condition was uh, Gentile. That was his condition. Uh, he was something other than. He was something outside of the law practicing um, covenant community of the Jews. In fact, Peter thought him to be unclean, unlawful to even associate with, because there was a dividing wall between these two people in his mind, because he was of another nation. So then, according to the text, uh, Cornelius was not only an unclean Gentile, but he was a Roman Gentile on that. And he was a centurion in the Italian regiment. Yet, this Gentile uh, uh, at, at, was coming into the new covenant. And it was kind of a mind blower for him. So the common assumption is that uh, this means everybody and anybody from that point forward at least could come into the new covenant that it opened up to all humanity and I'm going to show you as I've been doing that that is simply not the case the new covenant was specifically promised to and for the house of Israel and the house of Judah it was to all Israel uh, in other words only those connected to the first covenant and Cornelius was one such Gentile he was an Israelite Gentile he was a descendant uh, more than likely of the house of Israel now look if you just shook your head uh, to that in disagreement, then perhaps your mind and perhaps your ears are not willing to consider this angle. And if so, that's fine. Just don't waste your time with this. That's fine. But if you're not willing to waste your time to listen to this with an open mind and an open Bible, uh, then don't take time to comment. You know, it's kind of amazing to me. I, I find it curious how so many people respond to these lessons without actually following or listening or watching the lessons. It's like, how can you refute something that you, when you don't know what is actually presented? That doesn't really make sense to me. So uh, anyway, initially, I put together this lesson on Cornelius. It was about 15 minutes long. I'm not kidding you. And then I sprinkled a little stuff here. I added a little information here. And before I knew it, I had like an hour, hour and a half of material. So uh, look, I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, in fact, I'm going to take my time. This is probably going to be a two-parter on Cornelius because there is so much uh, to first deconstruct here. And then we have to lay a contextual foundation in order to understand the setting as we arrive in Acts 10. So uh, if you don't have the patience for this, just move on. That's fine. I get it. Um, or if you want just like a quick five minute little explanation, you know, of who Cornelius is, or if you just want me to confirm what you think you already believe, um, then go somewhere else. That's fine. I, it doesn't matter to me. But if you want a thorough answer, if you want a scripturally based, reasonably thought out answer, and you're willing to actually listen to it, well, stick around and I'm going to give you one. Okay, up to you. So most of you are familiar with the story. You have Cornelius. He had a vision. Uh, an angel said, hey, go see this dude named Peter. And then Peter had a vision. And 
Then Cornelius drops in and uh, Peter decides to meet with him, even though, as Peter explained in Acts 10, 28, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with uh, or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Okay, so look, look before we get too deep into the actual scriptures here, I'd like to dispel a couple of uh, erroneous assumptions that most of us make when it comes to this character Cornelius, uh, because right off the bat, we tend to walk into this episode with presuppositions, I think, that lead us uh, in the wrong direction. Um, when we read stuff like this, Acts 10, 1, there was a certain man in, the, uh, in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment or the Italian band. So those who insist that Cornelius was a Gentile, well, that is correct. That, that is the case. He was. Um, what they do not see or what we, we fail to understand uh, is what the story is desperately trying to clue us in on is that he was an Israelite Gentile. Uh, the text is trying to, to demonstrate what kind of a Gentile he was. And that's the whole point of the story. He was a descendant of Israel in the nations. Now, the assumption that he had no connection with Israel uh, in the first covenant is simply wrong. And that is because they are not seeing the forest for the trees. We got to look up a little bit. You know, we, we quickly see words like centurion and I Italian, and we see a, a non-Jewish name, we say, like Cornelius, and we say, see, he, Cornelius, he was a high-ranking officer in the Roman army, right? Surely foreigners couldn't rise that high in, in the ranks, right? Uh, he was a Roman, uh, and he was probably Italian to boot, right? So he was in the Italian band. So what's more, it's obvious that, you know, that's, a, that's not a Jewish name, right? It's, it's a Hellenistic uh, Roman name. So uh, not to mention the fact that the text specifically says he was from another nation. So this dude couldn't have been an Israelite. He couldn't have been. Look, when we approach a story like this, we need to remind ourselves uh, it, it's just a smaller story. It's a, it's a segment within the larger story. It's a part of the whole, and it would never contradict the whole story. Never. In fact, it makes more sense that this smaller story within the larger story confirms or reiterates what the larger, larger story is all about. It's called consistency. And so we must remember the story that has come before it through the long line of the prophets. I'm talking context here, folks. Truth is, when we reach the New Testament, the contextual setting and background is the story of Israel under covenant and law. That, that's the big picture context. That's the background. So look, when Peter a Jew, right, said that Cornelius was of another nation, there's a historical, there's a prophetic, there's a covenantal backdrop to that, right, right behind it, and we need to read this through that backdrop, through that lens, the same one that we've been covering every single lesson, and the context is this. This is it right here. You ready? Listen. The kingdom of Israel was split. They were a divided nation that divided into to two, two nations. All Israel was divided. One house became two. And the hostility between these two houses, that's the context. A distinction developed within all Israel. There was a dichotomy between the, the Israelite Jew who were basically kept by Yahweh. They kind of remained in that covenant. They kept that covenant moving forward. Forward. You have the Israelite Jews. And then you also have the Israelite Gentiles. Those that were cut off. Those were scattered in the nations. That's the big picture there. Think about it. Peter saw anybody and everybody who was not a Jew to be of another nation. 
anybody, and that included his long-lost brothers of the northern kingdom, descendants of the house of Israel. But here's the kicker. While Israel became two nations, they were two nations, the prophets saw these two nations coming together to be one again. Ezekiel 37, 19 through 23. I will take the stick of Joseph, which is, in the hand, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will put them together with the stick of Judah. I will make them into a single stick, and they will become one in my hand. When the stick on which you write are in your hand and in full view of the people, you are to tell them that this is what the Lord God says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations to which they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will rule over them. They will no longer be two nations and will never again be divided into two kingdoms. So, so do you see that this is why and this is how Peter uh, considered Cornelius uh, to be of another nation. This was the storyline of redemption. Israel scattering, right? Gathering back to God. Scattering, there was a kingdom split, two nations, back into one. This is the contextual lens through which we must uh, read and interpret Acts 10 and 11. For example, we see the, the confirmation in the New Testament that the Jews, they had no dealings with outsiders. We, we know that. We see that. Uh, meaning those outside their covenant, covenant world of law, right? That meant everyone, including their cut-off covenantal ancestors who at one time had once been a part of it. But they had become excluded. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well. We, um, you're probably familiar with that. John 4, verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Well, who were the Samaritans? Well, let me give you the short answer, the biblical answer, uh, according to the prophets. Uh, Samaritans were, were a people once connected to Yahweh through covenant, but they were cut off. They were scattered. They were defiled. They were uh, assimilated into the nations. They were paganized. They were descendants of the house of Israel, right? Isaiah 7, verse 9, the head of Ephraim, is Samaria. Samaria was the, the capital city, city, or it was like the, the big chief city uh, of the kingdom of Israel, and it would continue to be so. Uh, and, and I know I keep saying this, but this is uh, the, the, the story that develops, and this brings us to the New Testament. The kingdom of Judah, that's the Jews, uh, they had no dealings with Ephraim, the head of the northern tribes, the kings. Uh, this is the division that develops uh, within all Israel. This was the enmity, the enmity between the houses. This was the dividing wall of hostility. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. That's, that's in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Folks, listen to this. Just listen to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 11. And listen to this in light of Israel's story of this kingdom division, division and the promised kingdom restoration. And honestly, this really only makes sense within Israel's world of law within covenant and the promises that were made to them by the prophets in the Old Testament. Listen, Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that you who are Gentiles in the flesh. How were they Gentiles in the flesh? They were Gentiles in the flesh because they no longer practice circumcision. Not when they were out in the nations, not when they're out there practicing their pagan ways. They had become Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time, you 
were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were cu cut off and strangers to the covenant. Remember uh, Hosea 5, their children would become zur. They would become strangers, alienated, estranged, strangers to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, remember that Israel was going to be made far, Israel far, afar, <laughs> um, had been brought near by the the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has torn down the, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing his, in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. Look, you guys, the, the reconciliation that is happening here, it pertains to the law. The law. Israel's law. That's where, the that's where the division was, and that's where the re reconciliation would be from the law. That would only make sense to Israel. Um, he did this to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and reconciling both, both houses, both kingdoms, to them, to God in one body. That's the body of Christ through the cross by which he extinguished their hostility. Their hostility. Both houses. He came and preached peace to you who were far away. That's all those scattered out there. All those Israelites, they were far away. And peace to those who were near, whether those were Jews um, it, close by, or they could be dispersed Jews within the, the near uh, diaspora. For through Him, we both have access to Father by one Spirit. So come on. Y here's the point that I'm getting at. We need to push through uh, our surface level assumptions to see the real story here. Uh, the references to Cornelius as a centurion of the Italian band, they don't point to his ethnicity. They merely confirm his occupation and his position, not his nationality. And the fact that Cornelius was considered of another nation, that only confirms, uh, and that's consistent with the story of Israel splitting uh, into two separate nations. They were two nations. Now, let me give you some information that you might not be aware of. Uh, the truth is, probably the majority uh, of those serving in the Roman army and the Italian regiment were not ethnic Italians. They were not. Why? Well, because Rome, uh, like many ancient cultures, they were masters of assimilation. They incorporated men of various nations and ethnicities into their army. They even allowed them opportunity to climb up that proverbial ladder uh, within their occupation. And this is well documented. The truth is... Uh, the Roman army was filled with men uh, from all around the then known world. Africa, the Middle East, uh, like the France and, and, and French and German areas, everywhere. You know, as far as the Roman Empire reached. And, and you know what? It was a pretty good deal for a lot of these men. Um, it was a secure job. Well, unless you died, of course. But it was a secure job. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing that happened is these, the enlistees, the enfranchised enlistees, they were given Roman citizenship. They were then considered Romans, and that was a perk. So if they served for 25 years, and I got one source that says 26 years, I'm not sure what it is, uh, they could actually kind of retire with some sort of a pension, uh, and they were granted land. So it was a it was a good deal for some, it, and it was attractive for many. But the point is, uh, to be in the Roman army, that didn't mean you were, were Italian. Uh, it did mean you were Roman. But to be Roman was more of a status. Uh, it was not. It was a term for citizenship. Uh, don't forget, Paul. Paul was a Roman, right? And yet he was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, but he was a Roman. Remember, he got into some trouble, and they were going to beat him and all that. And he was like, "Hey, wait a minute! I'm a Roman." You know. Then that kind of scared him off because. Romans had rights. He was a Roman citizen. So 
If we dig just a wee bit deeper into various historical, you know, reputable sources, you're gonna find that the Italian regiment, the Italian band, uh, consisting of Roman citizens, right? All soldiers were granted Roman citizenship. Uh, it certainly did include some ethnic Italians, of course, but there were likewise men of various ethnicities from all nations, and that's just a fact. The point is, you know, it's, it's not only reasonable, but I think it's likely that there were many descendants of the house of Israel in the nations assimilated into the Roman world and serving in the Roman army. Now get a load of this. I'm not just talking Israelites in the nations, the house of Israel. Uh, I'm talking the Jews. We're talking the Jews as well, the house of Judah. Many men, many Jews served in the Roman army. This is, this is verifiable. Um, and man, it's kind of mind blowing too. And you know, honestly, I, I've always been kind of ignorant of this stuff. I'm sure many of you uh, have been as well and of this history. I, I always assumed this wasn't really the case. Um, I've always heard and assumed that Jews were, you know, they were granted uh, exemption um, from military service, kind of a, kind of a in, appeasement method of Rome, if you will to keep the peace. So, uh, but that's simply not the case. Um, Andrew Schoenfeld in his article, Sons of Israel in Caesar's Service, Jewish Soldiers in the Roman Military, he writes this. <clears throat> In the part, the participation of Jews in the Roman military is a topic that is underemphasized or frankly ignored by historians. Most often, scholars quote the exemptions from military service granted to Jews at Ephesus or Delos, or elaborate on the difficulties that Sabbath observance and dietary laws pose to Jewish men interested in serving under the imperial flag. When the issue of Jewish service in the Roman army is addressed, it is not without a certain degree of skepticism, and Roman Jews in imperial service are often cast in the light of renegades or apostates. That's page 116. Now, jumping down to page 126, uh, Mr. Schoenfeld says this, Based on these examples from the primary sources contained in the historical record, it is evident that Roman Jews served in the military from the beginning of the Pax Romana down to the days of the early 5th century. The many sources, pap papyri and tablets referenced in this article form a corpus of incontrovertible proof that Roman Jews were active in the armed forces of the empire. Now, author Victor Davis Hansen, in his book, Makers of Ancient Strategy, um, on page 173, suggested that Herod uh, probably modeled his army uh, after the Roman army. And he says, it is likely that many Jews were recruited into the Roman legionary or auxiliary army, army both in his reign and later. Now, think about this. Israelites and Jews served in the Roman army. It, it, it's really not that hard to conceive, really, when you think about it. Jews could be Roman citizens. <clears throat> Paul was a, a Roman citizen. He was a Jew. I've already mentioned that. Uh, Jews were assimilated into Roman culture. Uh, um, I just don't think we really think much about this, or I don't think we really want to. We think, no, Jews wouldn't do that. You know, that'd be a violation of the law anyway. They, they, were, they were strict adherence to the law. I'm thinking, really? Is that really what we, how do we know that? You know, the entire the entire history of Israel, biblically speaking, uh, under law, it's an ongoing transgression against the law. It's neglection of the law uh, until they would come to their final end at that final perverse generation, right? And look, the, the truth is this, we, we really don't know. We really don't have a clue uh, as to the specific everyday religious practices of the typical Jew living in the first century. Now, we can guess, we can speculate, you know, and we can try to idealize it, uh, but it doesn't make it so. We, we tend to think, oh, the Jews, they were practicing their laws, law every day. They were adhering to the law, blah, blah, blah. They did this. We don't know that. Uh, again, Andrew Schoenfeld uh, continues on page 125. He says this, for the most part, 
contemporary Jewish scholarship has chosen to de-emphasize or ignore the important contributions of the Roman Jewish community in general and Jewish soldiers in particular. This has occurred partly because of the high level of assimilation enjoyed by these Diasporan Jews, but also because the religious individuals who recorded Jewish history at the time viewed them as traitors. Listen to this. It is important to remember that Jewish religious practices across the Roman Empire were extremely variegated, and one cannot attempt to reconstruct a type of normative Judaism from the text of rabbinic, rabbinic scholarship. In fact, so here's another interesting quote from Tacitus. Uh, evidently, there was a, a senatorial decree around 1980 AD, and this ordered practitioners of Egypt, Egyptian and Jewish rites, so there's your Jews right there, to, to either abandon their religion or face expulsion from Italy, okay? Now, I didn't know this, and, and perhaps you can question the veracity of this, and you can go to the source, and you can see how accurate this is, but, you know, this is a a record from the historian Tacitus uh, from the Annals 2 uh, 85. Here we go. And there was a discussion about the expulsion of the Egyptian and Jewish rites, followed by a senatorial decree that 4,000 freedmen infected with that superstition and of suitable age should be brought to the island of Sardinia in order to keep a check on the activities of bandits there. And if any of them perish because of the harshness of the climate, it would be a cheap loss. Uh, the rest were to leave Italy unless they abandoned their profane rights before a certain day. So look, I'm making a very simple point here. According to Tacitus, uh, these 4,000 freedmen infected with the superstition of Jewish rites, he's talking about Jews here, practicing Jews, uh, they served in the Roman army. That's what, that's, that's what I want you to get from this. Now, obviously, he didn't think very much of these Jews. Uh, they seemed to be expendable to him, but they did serve in the Roman army, and that made them Roman citizens. And it, it does seem to me that these Roman citizens, it's almost, it seems as though they might be even be serving forcibly. I don't know. But there's plenty of examples of Jews uh, serving in a voluntary capacity. I ran across one. Matthias was a Syrian Jew who served in a Roman legion under Nero. And he received his Roman citizenship in 68 AD. And there's many, many, many others. So look, this isn't a new idea. Rome was not the first uh, empire to enlist their, their subjugated people into their army. It's actually a brilliant assimilation strategy, okay? Josephus brings you know, to light this exact same point uh, in Antiquities of the Jews, got book 13, chapter 2, section 3. Uh, this is a letter from King Demetrius to the Jews. Now, uh, I think he was king of the... Seleucid Empire, right? So we're, we're talking like the Maccab Maccabean times, which is like, you know, 150, 160, something like that, BC. So we're talking a couple hundred years earlier. Um, so this actually confirms the long recorded history, the pattern of Jews serving in military under foreign rule. Okay, this is this is nothing new. Um, it, you know, kind of like you have a puppet state providing military puppets for the puppeteer uh, nation who is who are pulling the strings. Like you got Assyria, you got Babylon, you got Greece, you got Rome's right. So Demetrius wrote this according to Josephus. I set free Jews that are inhabitants in my kingdom, in order that no injury be done to them. I also give them leave um, to such of them as are willing to list themselves in my army, that they may do it, and those as far as 30,000, that's a lot of positions, which Jewish soldiers, wherever they go, shall have the same pay uh, that my own army hath. And some of them I will place in my garrisons, and some as guards about my own body, and as rulers over those who were in my court." So again, this is, this is revealing. Jews were invited 
to serve in another nation's army, the nation who essentially ruled them. And not only that, they could rise high in the ranks. So is it really far-fetched? Is it really that difficult to think that an Israelite, a descendant, descendant of scattered Israel, uh, Israelites no less, that they could rise high in the ranks uh, to like a centurion like Cornelius? Is that difficult to see? No, not at all. Um, you know, it's funny. I... I just don't think we hear much about this stuff, this historical stuff. And I, I, I wonder how much we really know about what was really going on, you know, in, in the ancient Jewish and Roman world collectively and how much is guesswork. I mean, I don't really know. I'm not an expert on this crap. Um, I think we, we tend to simplify in our minds to make it fit what we think the Bible says. That's what I think we do. And, and I think we tend to assume that while the Jews were oppressed and dominated by Rome, uh, but I think we also somehow assume that the Jews, that they somehow remained like, maintained a, a high level of like, autonomy and they separated culturally from Rome uh, or that they tried to be or that you know they kept practicing the law stringently as they should or that you know Rome essentially allowed the Jews to practice their religion as they saw fit as long as there's no turmoil and things ran smoothly um, you know like Rome basically allowed Israel to operate as sort of a sub-sovereign nation under the sovereignty of Rome. And I really don't know that. I'm, I, I'm not a historian, and, and I, I haven't really studied it in depth. Uh, but I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that clean cut. I think the Jews were so enmeshed into a Hellenized culture in that Roman Empire that I think it was a confusing time. Um, I think there was a lot going on. I think there was a lot of, you know, uh, Game of Thrones stuff going on and, and the Jews were a part of that game. So in any case, I know it seems like I'm rambling, but this is important to understand as we get to Acts 10. The big picture point that I'm making is this. I think we tend to forget or we just don't realize the scope and the impact of the Hellenization of the known world that had, had saturated the whole world at that point. And how Rome did what many dominating nations did. They incorporated, they enfranchised, they assimilated the people they ruled into their world. In fact, from a certain perspective, I think we can say that they actually created opportunities for a conquered people to kind of make a way for themselves in that new world. But in order Order to do so they were going to have to play by the rules right when in Rome you do as the Romans do and then those possibilities I think were far better than than kicking against the goats for many of them point in case Cornelius right and, and that's what I'm getting at here now one last uh, erroneous assumption I guess you could say that I, I want to clear up is the issue with Cornelius's name. Okay, it, now obvious is it's not a Jewish name, so most seem to think that demands or that equates uh, to Cornelius being uh, ethnically Italian uh, or something other than an Israelite, you know, uh, descendant. Uh, no, not at all, not whatsoever. When people became enfranchised, or naturalized as Roman citizens. You know what they did? They took on Roman names. Now here's the historical truth, Ruth. It becomes very uh, difficult to, to distinguish between the native-born Roman citizen and the foreign-born, you know, but assimilated Roman citizen. It's very difficult to distinguish the two. Um, getting back to Andrew Schoenfield's uh, Sons of Israel in Caesar's Service, Jewish Soldiers in the Roman Military, he writes on page 115, the participation of Roman Jewish soldiers in the armies of Imperial Rome often goes unrecognized. This is mainly a result of a lack of recognition on the part of scholars who wish to use rabbinic sources as a benchmark for the Jewish practice in the Imperial Age. He's saying, you know, those might not be too trustworthy. It is also difficult to identify Jewish soldiers, many of them who had Greek and Latin names, regardless of their relationship to Orthodox Jewish communities of the time, the service of Roman Jews in the Imperial Armed Forces must 
be recognized. But there's more. Page 121. Many Diasporan Jews were fully enmeshed in Roman culture, used Greek or Latin names, and were active in the civic administrations of numerous cities around the Mediterranean. In this respect, they approximate modern Reformed Jews, and it is not surprising that some of the men of Jewish faith would look to establish careers in the Roman military. Unfortunately, this high level of integration puts the scholar at a certain disadvantage when attempting to identify Roman Jewish soldiers in the historical record. Unless their religion is specifically identified, Jews with Greek or Latin names escape our notice and it is probable that more Roman Jewish soldiers will be lost to posterity than can ever be identified. And what I'm proposing to you is that I'm identifying Cornelius as one such soldier in the army. He, uh, he could have been a Jew of the Diaspora, or he could have been a descendant of the House of Israel. It really doesn't matter. Uh, earlier I cited uh, Victor Davis Hanson from his book, Makers of Ancient Strategy, in which he suggested that the Jew served in the, the Roman army. Well, he affirms this same point that I just made about the names when he writes this. It is difficult to distinguish the, the Romans from their subjects, a procedure made even more complicated because natives, when enfranchised, took Roman names, and many cannot be distinguished in the historical records uh, from ethnic Italians. For example, while several of Herod's military officers or offers had uh, Roman names, we do not know if they were enfranchised Jews or soldiers imported or borrowed from the Roman legionaries army. So you see the dilemma. You see how we can make assumptions about Cornelius that, that simply aren't true and that quite honestly, uh, the historical records seem to contradict. Most Christians see Cornelius was a Roman centurion in the Italian regiment, and we just assume, or we hope, that's it, we hope, we want him to be an ethnic Italian. We want him to be a, a Gentile, never associated with that first covenant, because that would prove, well, that would prove me wrong. Um, See, I think it's more responsible, and I think it's reasonable to allow the, the whole of the story, Israel under law and under the thumb of the other nations uh, dividing, but eventually coming back together. I, I think that should help interpret this small story within the larger story. Uh, that would be letting the dog wag the tail. We don't want the tail to wag the dog, if you will. Okay, now look, I know this is just a, a lot of information, and maybe you think like this is pointless or useless information. Well, for you know what, for me, it was useful. I, I find this kind of interesting. But here's what I was trying to do. I'm trying to be responsible. I I'm trying to give us some accurate historical context to the story, to what we see in Acts chapter 10. I'm trying to be responsible before we actually get into the text. And I just, I don't think most people really want to do this. It takes too much time and I get that. But um, I felt it was responsible to provide some historical context and some foundation. So I did that. So with all that is mere prelude, let's actually get into scripture. Let's take a look at what Peter actually saw. And here's what we're going to dive into next time. I know, what a tease, huh? Next time, we're going to begin with Acts chapter 10, verse 11 through 14. He saw heaven opened in an object or a vessel like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and lit down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or un." 
clean. Now take note of these words you see on your screen that I've capitalized because these right there, those are your contextual clues. And we're going to dive into those next lesson. And uh, I know I'm teasing you, um, but uh, I simply don't want to attempt this because I've got like another 30, 40 minutes uh, of content here. So I'm going to cut it short right here. We're going to pick this up. Part two, Cornelius, next lesson. If you stuck with this, I'm proud of you. I bet you about four people did. In any case, we'll see you next lesson. Uh, take care and adios. <laughs> bye bye. I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. I said I just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in.